Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Spark Talks of our Bump to Baby Expo at Vernon Area Public Library. This session is called Raising a Baby, and we have 10 wonderful uh, experts in the field of early childhood. Um, uh, and we are so excited to have them here. They are local. They are connected to us, and through this presentation and these presentations, we're going to be able to give you some snapshots into their fields of expertise um, and providing um, answers to really uh, interesting questions that may be on the top of your mind. Um, so as if you're here, we are using our Q&A um, uh, option to connect with you. We do not, we cannot see or hear you, but we do have that as an option. So if you are able, go ahead and as you're coming in, um, put the age of your child that you have or, or children that you have, or if you are expecting, that way we can kind of gauge the audience um, and know um, who is attending and the ages that uh, are here with us today. Um, so you can feel free to go ahead and um, submit that. And uh, just as a general introduction to the Vernon Area Public Library, if you haven't visited lately, um, we offer programs for ages, all ages. I'm an early literacy librarian, so my focus is on um, ages zero to five, and we have some pretty remarkable programs. We've got story times and we're providing this as a parent education outreach. So um, I'm going to uh, stop um, my introduction and we're going to kind of uh, guide ourselves into our three sessions of Spark Talks. So our first session is called Taking Care of Mama First. Then we have our second kind of block, which is baby basics. And then our third block, which is raising a well-rounded child. So this is meant to address um, expecting parents all the way up to age two um, that you may have. So I'm going to pass it off to Jen. And as we go through this uh, presentation, go ahead and submit any questions that you may pop up into your head into the Q&A. And um, I will be the only one that sees those, so they won't be disrupting the presenter. So we can um, have those after, we'll have several opportunities to address those questions as we go through the presentations. Thank you. Jen, you're muted. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, I apologize for that. That's what happens when you have a college student who's on emergency bypass uh, and their phone rings while you're trying to present a program. So I'm glad that happened to me and none of our panelists this evening. So we would like to start off by uh, with Dr. Stern. Dr. Stern has a well family wellness chiropractic practice in Buffalo Grove and is specialized in pediatric maternity and family wellness care for over 20 years. In addition, Dr. Stern is the international examiner for chiropractors that look to specialize in pediatric and maternity care. Welcome, Dr. Stern. Thank you. And hi, I am Dr. Greg Stern, Stern Chiropractic. Uh, I've been specializing in chiropractic, pediatric maternity, and family wellness care for over 20 years right here in Buffalo Grove. And over those years, I've had women coming in for a whole bunch of reasons related to maternity care anywhere from wanting to get pregnant, but having fertility issues through hearing that chiropractic could be beneficial for them during their pregnancy and help them have a smoother, easier pregnancy, labor and delivery to those moms who are having the aches and pains that might come with pregnancy or those moms who are coming in at the very end, found that they were breached. They were told that they may have to schedule a version and a possible C-section, but they wanted a natural vaginal birth. And uh, they heard that I did the Webster technique and they were hoping that could help. Well, I've been able to help a whole lot of these women. And I found that moms are looking for two main things during their pregnancy. One, 
they want their baby to develop properly and have a happy healthy baby because what could be more important and two they're hoping they can have a comfortable pregnancy so that they can enjoy their time and bond with their developing baby so today i'm going to talk about two components of chiropractic care specifically applicable to you your nerve system and proper alignment of your spine and pelvis your nerve system is the master control system of your body it's the communication between your brain and body and body and brain and if it's working great awesome you're feeling good your pregnancy goes well your baby develops well and you have a smooth pregnancy labor and delivery but if there is any interference in how your brain is communicating with your body and your body with your brain that's where problems arise and what causes that stress well i mean we all have it but boy does it pile on when you're pregnant and so if there is that interference in communication well, maybe your digestion doesn't work as well as it should, or your immune system isn't functioning like it used to, or maybe you're experiencing some of those aches and pains that might come with pregnancy, or maybe your baby isn't getting all the neurological input, blood flow, and nutrition that it's supposed to get. Yeah, because the nerve system controls that as well. And chiropractic can help with all of those things. Now, proper alignment of your spine. When you have a lot of stress, the spine can get out of alignment. And the spine is there to protect your nervous system, one of the main components, your spinal cord. And when the spine is out of alignment, it interferes with that communication. The pelvis, why is that important? Well, it's directly connected to your uterus by ligaments, both in front and in back. When the pelvis is balanced, then the uterus is balanced, it's wide open, and the baby has plenty of room to grow, develop, and hopefully turn head down naturally when it comes time. But you're growing, changing, and things are happening during your pregnancy, you have a lot of stress, and guess what? That can cause that growing and changing on the inside as well, and that pelvis can get out of alignment. And when that pelvis gets out of alignment, the uterus can twist and torque, and it'll reduce the space available to that baby for proper growth, development, and eventually turning their head down naturally for a vaginal birth. And that's where this Webster technique comes into play. The Webster technique is a specific chiropractic assessment and adjustment created specifically for pregnant moms to clear up the nerve system, restoring that proper communication, and also to properly align the spine and pelvis. So the baby has all the room it needs to grow, develop, and hopefully turn head down for a smoother, easier uh, labor and delivery. Now, five minutes is a really short, short period of time to share with you all the information you need to know during your pregnancy. So please visit my website, www.sternchira.com. Go to the maternity page, go to the pediatric page, read it, get more information. And please stop, my, stop by my booth at the Baby Bump Expo. Ask me questions, say hello, I'd love to meet you. And reach out to my office, schedule an appointment. Let's make sure your nerve system and your spine and pelvis are all working well. So you have the smoothest and easiest pregnancy and the quickest and smoothest labor and delivery. Well, I really look forward to meeting you in person at the expo. Thank you and have a wonderful night. Peace. Thank you so much, Dr. Stern. Uh, Dr. Stern will be at the event on Saturday. And if you have any questions, you can drop those into the Q&A now. And Dr. Stern will have a chance to answer those in a minute after Melissa's uh, presentation. So we next have... Melissa Tidell, who is a fit for mom prenatal instructor and mom of three who lives in Libertyville, Illinois. Libertyville, Illinois. Melissa has been an active member of Fit for Mom since 2014 and became a certified instructor in 2017. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so many expecting moms aren't sure how to approach exercise during pregnancy. They might feel a little intimidated or nervous about what they're allowed to do. Um, so I'll preface this by saying, always talk to your doctor, be sure you're cleared for exercise because every mom and every pregnancy is different. Um, even if you have multiple pregnancies, um, but the reassuring thing to know is 
physical activity during pregnancy has significant health benefits, both for mom and baby. The World Health Organization and the American College of Sports Medicine have both issued research-based recommendations indicating the benefits of regular exercise um, and they far outweigh the risks for mom and baby. So I'm gonna go through a nice lengthy list of benefits of exercise during pregnancy. So hang in there with me. Um, but it's really good to know what you're doing to help your own health and your baby. So um, it, exercise during pregnancy promotes muscle strength and endurance. Um, this is especially important because it reduces that pain and discomfort that you might have with your changing body. It improves your posture and your core stability, especially as your babies, uh, as your belly grows and um, reduces the incidence of lower back pain, swelling and constipation, which all can happen when you're pregnant. Um, it may help prevent and treat gestational diabetes. And when you're working out, you're delivering oxygen to all parts of your body, including your baby. So that can help improve your brain function, um, it can help increase your energy levels, which when you're pregnant, your body's working really hard. So a little energy boost is always a good thing. It can enhance your mood. So that feeling of your sense of accomplishment, your confidence, um, it can also be a, a source of self-care. And if you're working out with other people, uh, an opportunity for social interaction, um, and then it helps with improved sleep patterns, which during pregnancy, sleep can be a little bit tough. So that's a positive. Um, it can control symptoms of anxiety and depression. So going back to those mood benefits, it can control unnecessary weight gain and help prepare your body for labor and delivery. That strength and endurance is, is helpful there. And finally, it can help set you up for successful exercise programs postpartum in that recovery stage. So um, not only does it have benefits for mom, but also, as I said, for baby, it has a positive uh, impact on baby's brain and heart as you're delivering that oxygen and that blood flow to baby. Um, it can reduce diabetes and improve baby's BMI. So lots of good things, lots of reasons to exercise during pregnancy. Um, the ACOG guidelines, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, have gone through recent updates and sometimes we know of the old version of updates. So the um, current recommendations are that pregnant women without contraindications, so without some of those serious medical concerns are encouraged to engage in regular, moderate intensity physical activity. The guidelines recommend 150 minutes per week. So that might be about 30 minutes most days of the week and uh, should include strength training. So. Um, that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how often um, to exercise. And then obviously we're avoiding high contact sports or activities with risk to any kind of like abdominal impact or falling. Um, another thing is it used to be we were thinking about a certain heart rate to measure our um, exercise intensity. And now um, ACOG guidelines talk about rating of perceived exertion. So how you feel you're exerting yourself as a better measure of exercise intensity. Um, it's good to be aware of exercising if it's, um, if you're feeling overhydrate, uh, overheated or dehydrated and making sure that you're keeping cool and hydrating regularly. Um, and finally, women can perform supine exercises. So on your back, as long as you don't have pre-existing conditions and it's a short period of time, about two minutes um, or less. So prenatal fitness has to adapt and change with each trimester as your body changes and it has to be individualized to how you are feeling physically and mentally. So our Fit for Baby prenatal classes incorporate safe, empowering, intentional movements, um, functional movements to protect your body, prevent injury, prevent injury and, um, you know, work on balance, joint stability and mobility, muscle strength and safe core movements. So um, I hope that if you're expecting, you can join us at one of our Fit for Baby prenatal classes. If you've got a young child, our stroller fitness classes are a great option. Um, so check out our schedule and visit our booth at the Expo on Saturday. I'd love to meet you. Thank you, Melissa. 
Um, so that ends the first block, which deals uh, primarily with uh, uh, prenatal um, concerns. And uh, we have a couple questions here. Um, the first question uh, is for Dr. Stern. Is chiropractic care safe for pregnant women and babies? Um, thank you. And yes, uh, chiropractic care is completely safe for pregnant moms and babies. Um, no, no real research out there to show anything different. And the force used to adjust a, a brand new baby is only the pressure that one would comfortably place on their eyeball. And since moms have relaxing in their system, uh, minimal, minimal force is needed. Not only is it safe, but it's comfortable. And most moms are getting off the table saying, ah, oh, this is the best thing in the world. And by the way, I have a specialized table where the belly drops out big enough for the largest of twins. Uh, so this is a place you can lay face down comfortably without any problems. Thank you. Um, and I have another question. This one's for Melissa. The question is, um, how is exercise different through pregnancy? Does it vary based on the stage that you're at? Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing is just listening to your body and checking in with how you're feeling each day, because each day and each week can be different. Um, towards the beginning, you might be dealing with nausea, fatigue. Um, so your limitations are really based on how you feel. You can work out as you were before pregnancy. Um, and then as things kind of level out in your, you know, more golden trimester in that middle part, um, you can focus on form and posture maybe that's more of the focus than like speed intensity. Um, and then finally in third trimester, your body's working really hard, bringing in lots of oxygen, moving lots of blood, your belly's grown. So you need to watch out for your bounds and safety in that case. So the priority there is really strength for um, labor and delivery and safety and comfort as far as your changing body. So um, the, the bottom line is listen to how you feel um, because it changes all the time when you're pregnant. Great, thank you. Um, those are the questions that I received for that block. So we will head to our second one, baby basics. Jen? Hey, uh, first off, we have uh, Dr. Relina Ghosh and Dr. Elizabeth Michaels from Pediatrust. They have over 30 years experience combined as board certified pediatricians. They serve families at Lakeshore Pediatrics, Pediatrust as community members, parents, and physicians. Welcome, Dr. Ghosh. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so I will be doing the presentation because we have five minutes and I wanna make sure that I get in all of our um, talking points. Um, so my topic is your baby is here, so now what? So um, just thinking about actually, oh, okay, hold on one second. So if you just think about all the things you have done to get here today, there's been a lot um, for the pregnant moms and expecting moms on this call. You've been to lots of doctor's appointments and ultrasounds, have had lots of blood tests and have been doing your research online. You're registering for baby gear, getting ready for baby showers. You're trying to eat well, take in certain foods, avoid certain foods. You're trying to get in enough rest. Um, you're trying to put together all that gear and you're scheduling your maternity leave and work leave and you're trying to pick a pediatrician. But what's next? Well, your baby's here. These are pictures of two of my kids, okay, right in the first 24 hours of life. And it's an exciting time, but it can be nerve wracking and it can bring up a lot of questions. So what I wanna to do today is go over what happens in those first few days, um, just so you know what to expect. So first, right after your baby's born, um, the baby comes out, they put your baby under the warmer light, they take lots of towels and dry your baby and say what they call stimulate your baby, which basically is just get your baby to cry and take in those deep breaths. Most babies will get two shots. Um, one is a vitamin K shot, and this helps reduce bleeding um, and risk of bleeding. And then the other one is a hepatitis B vaccine. We do recommend that in that very early newborn period to reduce the risk of hepatitis B. 
Um, babies have antibiotic ointment that's put on their eyes. And the reason they do that is to reduce risk of infection. And a lot of hospitals now are delaying that first bath. They don't do it in the first couple of hours. Rather, they'll wait 12 to 24 hours because that vernix or that white sticky stuff that's on them is actually good. It has antibacterial qualities that can help your baby. Then usually the baby is swaddled in a blanket and brought back to you very quickly. Now, if you are, have complications with your delivery or there's a C-section, it could take a little bit longer, but usually they try to get the baby right back to you so you can do that early bonding. Now, if you choose to nurse, this is gonna be a big priority during your nursing stay and we're happy to talk to you more about that. Lakeshore Pediatrics has some lactation consultants we work with very closely in our office. A routine hearing screen is done as well as elective circumcision if you have a boy and you choose to do that. So one of the things that you hear about really early on are an APGAR score. So what's an APGAR score? This is like the first grade that your baby gets after birth. And so it's at a, of a scale of 10. And as you can see, there's five different categories that your baby's graded on. And our goal is that your baby's getting a nine out of, or um, a nine or 10 out of 10. And basically they're looking at your baby's appearance in terms of the skin color, the pulse or the heart rate, whether the baby's moving faces and pulling away from um, negative stimuli, if they're moving around and breathing well. Most babies I see will get eight or nines and they check these scores at one minute and five minutes. After that, um, if the baby's having lower scores, you'll probably get some kind of intervention. So a lot happens in the first 48 to 72 hours in the hospital. First of all, your baby's sleeping a lot and hopefully you are too because you're recuperating from that delivery that was so hard on you. And at the same time, you're trying to nurse and feed your baby. Now, remember your baby's not getting that much, but whatever the baby's getting is important. First of all, every opportunity to nurse is like a practice session of how to latch on. And our goal is to try to wake up your baby and nurse your baby every two to three hours. If things aren't going well, it's very okay. And don't be shy to ask, ask for a lactation consult, whether it's in the hospital or after you go home. And it will take first time mom four to five days for your milk to come in. A big secret that a lot of parents don't realize until after their baby is born is that weight that you put on the um, birth announcement, that weight is gonna drop. Babies can lose up to 10% of the, their body weight in the first week, and that can be very normal. That's one of the reasons you wanna come back and see your pediatrician after a couple of days. And every day your baby's in the hospital, they're gonna get a checkup by their pediatrician or a pediatric hospitalist. So what if your baby needs a little bit more after delivery? Well, if your baby's premature, um, if there's any breathing problems or low blood sugars, a lot of times babies are in the special care nursery on the mother baby floor. And they may need some closer monitoring, but that can be okay because they'll be followed very closely by the neonatologist and the doctors there. Um, so when do you finally get to get ho go home? Usually it's two days after a vaginal delivery or three days after a C-section. Once you get home, try your best not to entertain guests because you need rest and so does your baby. But that doesn't mean that you can't take help from your friends and family who are there for you. Concentrating on feeding and nursing. Your goal is 10 to 12 times in 24 hours. And moms, remember, you actually need more calories when you're nursing than when you're pregnant. Um, it's great to have your baby right there by you. Um, but don't co-sleep. It's a high risk factor. Um, and we want to make sure we protect your baby and you and keep close track of those urine and wet diapers and the stool diapers because your pediatrician will be asking you. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more. We can talk at when you stop by our booth for about cord care and baths. But um, the main thing is I want to say is um, please stop by our table at Lakeshore Pediatrics on Saturday and you can get some more information about the newborn period, picking a pediatrician or any other information you may have. Dr. Michaels and I will be there to welcome you. Happy parenting. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh, and thank you, Dr. Michaels, who is also on with us. Um, next up, we have the baby doctor and company. Dr. Angela Marcotte is the baby doctor. She is a pediatric physical therapist based in Chicago, Illinois. She is, pa she is a passionate advocate for infant physical development and works to empower families when their babies need support in their movement milestones. Welcome, Angela. Hi there. Thank you, Jen, with Vernon Area Library. I'm so excited to be with you all to share a little bit about what I do. I am a pediatric physical therapist by trade, providing these services in Chicago, Lake and Cook County suburbs, both virtually and in person. So I'm really excited to share with all of you a little bit about what I do and specifically advocacy for baby neck movement and baby head shape. So let's get down to it. 
So I always like to start with an icebreaker when families, new parents, moms to be, think about baby milestones, baby physical milestones. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, many families think the big things, tummy time, crawling, standing, walking milestones. It could also mean more generally when to start solids, when to transition a baby from a bassinet to a crib, when to stop a Velcro swaddle. Social media has taken the world by storm. So looking at things like social media, Instagram, Facebook, and apps is something that families love looking at check-ins to how to support their baby's development and milestone check-ins. It can also mean something with going to the pediatrician's maybe looking at the vaccines, a vaccine that needs to be done at a scheduled time with supporting the baby's development. So with the area of development that I'm going to be talking about today, it's going to be early baby milestones. So what does that mean? Early baby physical milestones is neck movement, asymmetrical neck, the neck turns, and the baby head shape. So I'm so excited to share with you visually and a little bit about what I do to support those milestones. Neck movement, head shape. Neck movement, head shape. Let's keep going. So just a little bit about torticollis. Torticollis is a diagnosis that I treat as a pediatric physical therapist. That means tight, weak, uncomfortable, unmoving neck. That means the baby turns only one way. The family has attempted to reposition during sleep and the family has been unsuccessful. The baby doesn't lift their head during tummy time. The baby benefits from support with turning their baby head with complete full range of motion, full strength, and full mobility. Many times families mention to me that the baby neck looks red or is difficult to bathe during bathing. The chin is down instead of free and up. And that's a little, little bit about torticollis. Keeping going, let's talk about plagiocephaly, which is a very fancy word for flathead. Flat head and flat spot is all you need to know. Whether the left side is flat, which means that the baby is looking more to the left, a right flat spot, meaning the baby's right head, right back of the head is flat, or when you look at a side view or a lateral view, looking at the shape of the head, we like to see head shapes that are nice and nice and like an ice cream scoop. When a baby's head is spending too much time on the back of the head, then that means that the back of the baby's head is flat. Now, babies spend a lot of time on, the back, on their backs. Why? Because of ABC, a lone back crib, which is the safest sleep position for the baby, a lone back crib. But that being said, as a result of that recommendation, which is successful and a national universal recommendation, that has increased the rate of the incidence of flathead and flat spots. So now I invite the families, new moms to be, even the panelists, we're gonna play a little game called, can you spot the spot? So when we look at our pictures here, we like looking at a top down view. That's when you can see a flat spot, meaning a left flat spot or a right flat spot. So what do I see here? When I'm looking at my assessment, I see if we think of our hands like a leveler and the back of the head, that left looks more flat on the left. That's a left flat, left flat spot right there. Let's keep going. Looking at a top down view right there, I see a quite significant moderate to even severe right flat spot. That baby spends too much time sleeping, head turned to the right. Can you spot the spot? So what I see here is baby with a lot of hair. What we do with head shape, head shape assessments is that we like to wet the hair. Why? Because then we can really spot the spot. Hair can obscure the vision with looking at a flat spot. I see a right flat spot right there. What do we see here? I see Hands like a leveler, looking at the back of the head, top down view, I see a left moderate flat spot. We're gonna skip a little bit more because of timing. So when we think about the length width relationship of the head, a baby can also have a wide head. That is a wide head there. That's a wide head, right flat spot. And so if there's one thing that I'm going to educate you all about how to promote your baby's physical development is taking pictures. Families take infinite amounts of pictures, many selfies, take a picture of the front of your baby's face, take a picture of the sides, take a picture of the top down. Even as a newborn, this gives a world a wealth of information so that you can see if a flat spot is developing when your baby's a newborn 
two months, three months, four months, that's the time to spot the spot. Your baby, even as a newborn, should sleep with their head in a variety of positions, left turns, right turns, combination, on their own or with minimal support with repositioning. So I hope to see all of you to at the Vernon Area Library this Saturday, and I'm happy to answer all questions with what it means to promote your baby's head shape, baby development, and, and my tools with how to promote that. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, if you have any questions for Angela, please drop those in the chat. She'll be able to um, answer after this block and she will also be at the event on Saturday. Next up, we have Sleep Wives Consulting and Nima Patel is a pediatric sleep consultant for Sleep Wives Consulting. She works with families to help their children with healthy sleep habits and sleeping the 10 to 12 hours overnight. That would be wonderful. Thank you, um, Jen, for introducing me. Again, I'm Nima Patel. I live in Schaumburg, Illinois, a mom of two and a former physician assistant. And several years back, I switched my um, career to pediatric sleep because I feel really strongly about it after I had my own children as well. Um, just a little bit about infant sleep and newborn sleep. Priority is always, always, um, you know, safe sleep from using the AAP guidelines of, um, you know, on their back, no nothing but a fitted crib sheet in their bassinet or crib blankets um, all those under the age of one um, is the priority when I work with a family I work with families as young as one week old newborns all the way to age 10 and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about just early on newborn sleep and the simplest things that you can do to kind of help set up easy foundational sleep habits as your baby is growing as well um, one of the most common things that you will see for babies early on is day and night confusion, um, where they want to sleep all day, have deeper cycles of sleep throughout the day, and want to party all night and have a hard time settling at nighttime um, when we really want them to sleep, and us as parents want to sleep as well. Um, one of the quickest way and easiest way to fix this is um, keeping them in bright environments during the day, having lots of household noises, parents talking, maybe TV in the background, and just having a lot of sunlight sunlight coming into where the baby is hanging out and napping during the day. Um, capping the baby's naps to two hours to ensure that they're not getting their deepest cycles during the day and having adequate amount of feeds throughout the day so we can start seeing longer stretches overnight when baby has hit, you know, birth weight and birth back to birth weight as well as um, they're growing and developing and able to do those longer stretches as they inch closer to three months old and above. Um, and then at nighttime, you want to keep things really dark quiet, less stimulation, making sure that baby's in um, an optimal environment where we can teach baby that this is nighttime and it's not to party and it's really just to sleep um, at this point um, of time. Um, one of the other things that is a great cue for babies. It's really hard to do this really early on when babies are really just primarily eating and sleeping and pooping throughout the day and not having adequate alert times. But as baby grows, as we inch closer to the 12 week mark and above, um, you'll see a lot of active alert time where we can start establishing routines. Um, sometimes doing bedtime routines as early as, you know, six to eight weeks old can start to develop healthy practices for babies to cue their body that it's time to go to sleep and have our longest stretches of sleep overnight um, during that time frame of the day. Um, routine should consist anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes, which includes the last feeding of the day before they go into the nighttime as well. Um, just to sample bedtime routine, like this would be like an ideal bedtime routine where you have a bath time, pajamas, you know, bottle feeding or breastfeeding, have a quick story and then put down in the crib to kind of help them learn that, okay, when this, this portion of the day happens, when this routine happens, I'm about to go into the crib for my longest stretch of sleep. So as they get older and you practice the routine more often, they can kind of settle into this foundational skill of learning to sleep a little bit better. Um, eat, play, sleep patterns. So this is something that's very hard to do early on, but like I said, through the newborn phase, the more you practice it, the more it's, your baby's able to kind of understand what that means. And it's really the, the goal is to disassociate feed to sleep, right? So feeding to sleep oftentimes 
hinders a baby's ability to take a full feed. They tend to snack feed all day and hence fall asleep and not take those full feedings throughout the day. And then maybe wake up multiple times overnight to compensate for those calories throughout the nighttime. So when we follow an eat, play, sleep pattern, we want a baby to wake up, take their full feed, play, have some tummy time, have some activities with their parents, and then, you know, cue them with a quick nap routine or bedtime routine, if that's the portion of the day that we're at, to show them that this is when we're going to sleep. Oftentimes that when we're breastfeeding and yes, early on, we want to feed, feed, feed. That is our priority to gain weight, um, grow and have all these calories that the baby needs. But as they get older, we can start teaching them to take fuller feeds at certain portions of the day before they have to go into their naps or bedtimes as well. Um, so I'm Nima Patel. I, again, I work with the ages as young as one week old to 10 year old children. Um, I work with all sorts of um, different age ranges, situations. Um, I work virtually across the world, actually, um, globally. I've worked with so many families for the last seven years. Um, I'm a former PA that used to work in pediatric as well. And um, I'm happy to answer your questions that you may have. I look forward to seeing you at the expo this weekend and um, get to know all the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nima. Uh, please make sure and stop by Nima's table at the Bus to Baby class on Saturday. Next up, we have Associated Pediatric Partner Partners. Dr. Ariel Glicksberg is a board certified pediatrician working at the Associated Pediatric Partners in Northbrook and Buffalo Grove. He has been working there uh, for the last two years after completing his residency in pediatrics, as well as a fellowship in pediatric hematology and oncology at the University of Illinois Chicago. Welcome Dr. Glicksberg. Oh, Dr. Glucksberg, you're muted. Can you unmute? All right. Well, I started talking, but because you guys can hear me. Uh, so thank you, Jen. Um, as Jen said, my name is Ariel Glicksberg. I'm a pediatrician at Associated Partners. And tonight I'm going to talk about how and when to introduce solids to your baby. So introducing solids to your baby can be, is an exciting milestone, but it can also be a stressful one. So hopefully these tips will help alleviate some of that stress. So how do we know when a baby is ready to feed? The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends introducing solids between four and six months of age. <clears throat> Things to look out for are good head and neck control, your baby being able to sit up with support, showing interest in food and making chewing or feeding actions with their mouth. When your baby is showing these signs, they are ready to feed. To start, we begin with, with single ingredient, either pureed, pureed fruit, vegetables, or single grain cereal. And so it was shown that there are no recommendations for the sequence of the food, just that it should be one new food at a time. So give your baby just a spoonful or two to start, introduce one new food at a time, and wait two to three days before introducing the next food. Uh, this way, if your baby does have any allergies, it is easy to figure out to which food is causing it. Gradually, you can add more texture to the food as your baby gets more accustomed to eating, but avoid foods that can be a choking hazard. It's also important to limit sugary food intake and unhealthy fats. Introducing high allergen foods such as peanut butter, eggs, and fish around six months has been shown to decrease the risk of developing allergies. <clears throat> During the first year, foods to avoid are honey and milk. And after a couple of weeks, you can start combining foods and increasing the amount of food that your baby has. Letting your baby feed his or herself with its hands or spoons can also help improve uh, your baby's fine motor. For parents that want to prepare their own uh, food, here are some helpful tips. So be vigilant about sanitation. Use only well scrubbed and washed produce, clean your hands, utensils and cutting boards and countertops. Wash and peel produce to, and remove any seeds or pits. Cook the food until it's very until it's tender. Steaming and microwaving in just a little bit of water are good methods to retain vitamins and minerals in fruits and vegetables. When cooking meats and fish, remove all gristle, skin, and bones before cooking. 
puree or mash fruits. Pureed foods can be thinned if needed by adding breast milk, formula, or water, but cow's milk and milk, alter milk alternatives should not be used during the first year. Some foods pose a choking risk and are not recommended for infants, such as whole grapes, raisins, and pieces of hot dogs. Never add honey to food or drinks for children under 12 months, as it may contain clostridium botulinum spores. Also avoid adding corn syrup or other sweeteners as they only provide extra calories, but not nutrients. Make sure the texture and temperature are appropriate. And after warming foods, make sure to mix it thoroughly and recheck the temperature so to not burn your kid's mouth. Cook eggs, meat, and poultry until well done. Babies are especially susceptible to food poisoning caused by undercooked meats, poultry, and eggs. For convenience, freeze prepared foods and single serve containers for later use. And if you're cooking food for the spread of the family, remove the baby's portion before adding salt or seasoning as a baby's taste buds can be sensitive. After you've pre prepared the food, either serve it or refrigerate it right away. Keep homemade baby food in a covered container for one or two days in the refrigerator or one or two months in the freezer. Small portions served in separate dishes are ideal because any food that was served but not eaten must be thrown out. Bacteria thrive in the baby's mouth. So once a spoon goes into the baby's mouth and then touches the food, we don't wanna save that food for later. <clears throat> Also, it's definitely okay to buy store-bought baby food. Commercial baby foods are nutritious, uh, a nutritious option for feeding your baby. Today's commercial foods provide balance and variety with carefully controlled and consistent nutrient content. So don't worry if you decide to go with commercial baby foods. Here's some other really good sites if you wanna take a quick screenshot for just introducing baby's foods. So introducing solids to a baby is an important step in their development. It is important to follow guidelines for when and how to introduce solid foods and to offer a variety of healthy options. Remember to be patient and persistent as it may take time for your baby to adjust to solid foods and always consult your pediatrician if you have any questions or concerns about feeding your baby. Thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to meeting you all this Saturday. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
also, you know, is following those guidelines, really important. Thank you. And Dr. Michaels, did you have um, anything you'd like to add to that? I just accessibility, you know, in today's times, we know people are looking for the easiest way to get a hold of people. Of course, there's the good old phone. There are now systems in place with like opportunities like my chart to reach out with messages. Um, we try to be proactive and, you know, when we see our patients to make sure they know what to expect for our next visits and what have you. So just good education and communications and make sure that in a very comfortable environment, I suppose. Thank you. All right, I have another question. Um, this one I believe is for um, Nima. Um, uh, da, da, da. When do I switch my older baby to one nap per day? Awesome question. The dreaded one nap, right? Who wants to give up naps, really? Um, but really one nap is there's a, a big, not a big, but for a couple months of a spectrum between 12 months to about 15, 16 months as the, at the very latest when you want to um, switch to one nap. Some of the signs that you can look out for what to see if your child is ready for the one nap transition is, you know, if they're having early morning wakings, if they're having a hard time falling asleep at bedtime, if they're taking two naps and one of the naps they're, you know, fighting all together or they're it's turning into like a 30 to 45 minute nap when it used to be two hours or one and one hour or more. Um, so really like a few signs to see when your particular child is ready. Um, I don't think there's like a clear cut answer like 12 months you have to do this and 14 months you have to do this. It's really child dependent. So if you see those signs of early morning wakings, bedtime battles, um, vetoing a nap um, between the two naps that they're taking, it's probably a good time that they need to switch to a one nap schedule. Um, keep in mind, one nap transition is one of the hardest transitions and it takes about four to six weeks to fall into place until they actually fully adjust to a one nap um, routine a day. So, um, but yeah, there's not really like a specific age that I say that a child definitely has to go to one nap. Thank you. That um, was a selfish question. That was from me. Um, <laughs> I have a I have an eleven month old. So, um, thank you. Um, and but I'm sure many other people attending this have the same question. So, I appreciate it a lot, Nima. Thank you. Uh, another question that I believe is for Angela. We have: Can I do anything to help my baby's physical development? Oh no, she logged off accidentally. Oh boy. Well, uh, we'll save that for the end. Um, and one more question um, for Dr. Glicksberg. Is there anything I can do during pregnancy or with solids? I suppose as a pediatrician, you may not know the pregnancy question, but pregnancy or with solids to help decrease allergies in my baby? So yeah, so um, we recommend introducing the highly allergic foods uh, early, so around six months, and that is shown to decrease the risk of allergies. So, you know, we introduce peanuts at around six months. Um, you know, for my kids, I really just put peanut butter on my finger and put in their mouth <laughs> um, and watch them, gave it a little bit of time. I had Benadryl on hand, made sure that they didn't have any um, any allergic reaction and gave them more, but a probably more sanitary way to do it is, honestly, you could get like Bomba or little peanut puffs put it in a bowl, mix it with some hot water to mush it. Um, and you give them a little feet, you know, a little spoonful, give it 10, 15 minutes. Again, have Benadryl on hand just in case. If they don't have any reaction to it, then give them some more. But introducing those highly allergic foods early is the best way to prevent allergies. Of course, if there's a strong family history of allergies or anaphylaxis, then you might want to do that in a pediatric office or in an allergy an allergist office. Uh, but if there is none, then it's definitely safe to try those at home early. Great, thank you. Um, Angela, we did have a question uh, for you regarding, um, uh, can I do anything to help my baby's physical development? Yes, that's a great question. So promoting baby physical means many things. And a lot of that means caring positions. 
So, so many times families think about holding a baby and supporting the baby fully, completely up over the head. What I like to recommend with families is wear them as early as possible. So there's a number of baby carriers out there, ones that are more, uh, more supportive than others. One can support an entire baby. Another one is a tush baby, which is what I'm wearing now, which is something that really acts like another set of hands. So when you hold your baby with a baby carrier, it's really a wonderful thing to place your baby in different positions so that the neck can be flexible so that you're promoting your baby's development. It also puts the spine in a nice, comfortable, healthy, flexed position so that you can promote your baby's development in other positions. This is a nice supported sideline position. And again, when you have a baby carrier, it really acts like another set of hands for you and baby. Thank you. All right, let's uh, proceed on to Black 3, raising a well-rounded child. Jen? Okay, hey. so um, our first presenter, Learn to Talk with me, Stephanie Cohen, is not available to be with us this evening, but we do have a short video that she sent in to us that um, Kelsey will play in just a minute. So Stephanie Cohen is an early intervention speech language pathologist and the author of two board books. Her goal is to empower parents to be their child's best teacher. I know you've been told that one of the best things that you can do to support your baby's learning is to read every day, but maybe you've tried and your child doesn't seem so interested. I'm going to give you my five best tips to support your baby's communication, but really their overall learning with books. So first, know what to expect. Babies initially are exploring their world. They want to use their hands to hold objects, to look at objects, to move objects around. And books are no different. Your baby's going to want to figure out what this thing does. They might want to turn it upside down. They might want to grab it from you when you sit down for reading time. And I would let them because they're getting to know the objects in the ways that are the most interesting to them at that time. Your baby might just want to slam the book shut. Your baby might want to drop the book on the floor or bang it on a surface. Your baby might just want to look at one picture on the back. First, we're just getting to know these things and figuring out what they're for. As your baby's interest grows, they might start to look at the picture that you show them. That's exciting. They start to build their attention, right? As your baby gets older, they may start to sit for longer periods of time, but know that this can also be inconsistent, especially if they're working on walking, if they're working on playing with other toys, they may not always want to sit to read every single time. Their attention to reading will increase. Second, choose wisely. It helps to understand which types of books developmentally appeal to little brains the most. When your baby's a newborn, they're going to be really interested in books like this that have just high contrast because they're just still building their visual skills. Then you'll probably notice that they're really interested in looking at books that have simple photographs of faces. This is my first Learn to Talk book, my first board book, and I included all of the different close-up simple photographs of faces because that's what little brains are drawn to. Notice what your child likes and offer more of those types of books. The third thing you can do to support your child's communication development with books is follow your child's lead. You're gonna notice your baby has favorite books. They may like the one that has a little touch and feel element to it. They may like a book that has lots of faces and photographs. You also might notice that your child really likes to look at a first words book like this one that has lots of photographs of everyday objects. The fourth thing that you can do to support communication with books is to model the building blocks of language. Before children learn to say words, they begin to use different facial expressions, gestures, simple sounds, and then they get to words. So you can model all of those things as you're looking at books with your child. Your child may want to imitate a facial expression. So as you're reading this book, if your child shows interest in a specific page, imitate something on that page and then wait for your child to notice that you're doing it and maybe even attempt to imitate. You can also imitate gestures in books like rawr and simple sounds. Then you can model words on different pages. If you're reading a first words book, that might look like you just looking at a page that your child is staring at and naming the picture. Banana! 
banana, or you might model a sound that goes with the picture. <gasps> yum, 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 yum. As I try to model all of these different building blocks, I'm watching my child and I'm seeing what are they interested in imitating, and then we do more of that. As your baby grows and gains new skills, they're eventually gonna get to words. But remember, babies and toddlers learn to imitate those little building blocks of language first. And lastly, you can support your child's communication development by building book reading time into your daily routines. When you build book time into routines, your child will expect to have that special time with you and look forward to it. The more book reading is built into your routine, the more likely you are to do it. If you have any other questions about how to use books to support communication development and learning, feel free to find me on Instagram or TikTok or send me an email. I'm really excited to be here to support you and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Okay, thank you, Kelsey, for sharing that video with us. Um, our next group is Clementine Early Childhood Community, and we have Jessica Brown presenting. She is a Montessori teacher with an AMS certification for ages zero to three and six years of early childhood classroom experience. Jessica started Clementine Early Childhood Community as a space where families can look forward to enjoying um, purposeful and fun playtime and getting to know each other. Welcome, Jessica. Uh, Jessica, you are still muted. I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you we hear can. me now? Yes, we can. Oh, good. I'm sorry. I thought I had done it not correctly. Um, so again, hi. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to the families that are here tonight. Um, it's an exciting time to be expecting or to have a young baby, uh, a toddler. It's it's such a fun stage of parenthood. And uh, you know, with older kids myself, I'm excited for you. Um, for all of you just entering that stage. Um, so I'm gonna talk quickly tonight about five tips for what we call meaningful play. And uh, you know, don't kids already know how to play? Isn't their play always meaningful? Um, yeah, kids do know how to play. And I think sometimes what ends up happening is that adults interfere and insert themselves into kids' play and can sometimes make it harder for them to get the most out of their play experiences. So what we call meaningful play is play that supports kids' development and is engaging and joyful. And if you've spent time with young kids, I think you can probably think about what those two different kinds of play can look like. When kids are really engaged, they they almost enter a state that we adults can experience it when they're working as well, a flow state where they're either so focused that they're not even aware of what's going on around them or they're um, so excited and happy to be playing with a friend that it feels extremely natural and uh, you can tell that they're really engaged in what they're doing. And the contrast to that can be times where maybe you've seen a child who's really tired, who's overwhelmed, and their play ends up feeling sort of either mechanical or too busy. They're, they're not really um, experimenting. They're more just going through the motions of their play. So how can parents um, really set up their homes and, and their routines to maximize um, this meaningful play? Uh, first of all, thinking of our kids as capable. Um, I remember feeling this way as a mom of an infant that my job was to constantly pour knowledge into my baby all the time. Um, and even into the toddler years, I felt like I had to show every single way a toy could work, everything a toy could do, and that if I didn't do that, my child would never experience it or be able to figure it out on his or, or her own. I have one of each. Um, kids can actually guide their own play. They can choose their toys, they can experiment and figure out how toys work, and they can even help to clean up their work uh, or their play when they're finished. Even from a very young age, babies can let us know what they'd like to do. Um, from one uh, choosing one toy over another. So when kids are independent with their play, it builds engagement with their toys. Um, secondly, this is probably actually the most important one, uh, 
it's it's so important and it's so difficult to do in our society where you know Amazon is constantly flooding us with um, images of new toys. And once Amazon knows you have a baby or a toddler, you're going to be seeing a thousand advertisements for the best new toy. Babies and young children. They don't need very many toys at all. And not to say that they have to live a Spartan life or that, you know, grandparents can't ever buy them a toy. I don't mean to say that, but I think we can reframe our attitudes that we are providing the best childhood if we give the most um, possessions, offering kids fewer toys at a time, even if you own a lot of toys, putting out fewer toys at a given time. Um, not necessarily putting out all the pieces of a toy. If there are fewer things available, it makes kids, it makes it easier for kids to choose a toy, find that focus or flow state, and then put things away when they're finished. And too many Legos or blocks or crayons at a time can just overwhelm kids to the point where um, they can't really use anything in an engaged way. The, the third thing is curate and then display toys thoughtfully. We hear a lot about toy rotation, and that's kind of the idea I mentioned before, fewer toys out at a time. And we do want to rotate toys, but in a meaningful way that is based on our observations of kids. So watching how they play helps us see what they're interested in, what kinds of toys they're having fun with and that are keeping their interest over time. And then the other thing is in our homes as much as we can, displaying toys in a way that makes it easy to see what's there for them to take out what they want and put away easily. Um, so a deep basket is harder for a child to get into than um, something shallower or a tray. And then you know, open spaces allows the materials to call to kids instead of um, having to dump and see what's inside a basket. Number four, restore the environment. It's a nice way of saying cleaning up. Um, Less clutter helps kids choose purposely and focus on what they're using at a given moment. So they can help us put things away and we can also guide them when they're too young to do that. And just making that a part of the routine means that they always have a clean slate um, to play with the next thing that calls to them. And then finally, be intentionally hands-on and intentionally hands-off. So kids need our time and our attention, obviously. They also need some time without it so that they can experiment, so that they can um, figure out how things work, so that they can interact with siblings or friends. And so spending as much time as we can with them when we're with them, so without a phone or without other distractions, and then letting them see that it's okay for us to be doing dishes or folding laundry or reading our own book um, is a great way to allow them space to experiment and have fun um, without us sometimes as well. Um, so I'd love to meet you at the expo on Saturday um, and talk a little bit about what our classes are like and what Clementine offers for parents from um, of, of children from birth all the way up to three years old. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, please make sure to stop by Clementine Early Childhood Community on Saturday. And next up, we have CDW at Play Child Care Center. Uh, Carrie Stenick is the Center Director at CDW at Play, at Play Child Care Center in Vernon Hills. She has been leading teachers and caring for young children with Bright Horizons since 1995. She is passionate about helping create a positive environment for children to learn and grow. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here, and I do look forward to meeting everybody on Saturday. Um, I'm really excited to talk about toddlers and twos and how independent they are. We've heard that phrase, terrible twos. It's really not terrible twos. It is um, a really good time for them to become independent, and I think that's the most challenging piece with our toddlers and twos. They wanna do everything by themselves. Um, and so there is definitely a path to independence that um, at our Bright Horizon Centers with our young preschool, which is Todd's and twos, we really focus on um, helping them become independent. Um, the first is just showing and modeling. Um, make it easy for them. They love to imitate our teachers. And so when we see them trying to do that, whether it's in a dramatic play area we definitely encourage that over and over. And that's something that can be done at home as well. Um, the other thing is uh, giving them specific steps or specific direction, um, simple one-step directions. You know, they want to put on their shoes and socks by themselves. Okay, let's get your socks, hand me your socks. Which foot should we do first? Let's do the right foot. So being very basic and very simple helps them find success as well. Um, 
probably the toughest part for parents because I know it was for me when my boys were little, but also as teachers is we need to resist the urge to jump in. Let them take the time to do those things on their own. Um, it might take twice as long. You might be in a hurry to get out the door, um, but it is so important to their growth and development to allow them that time. If you are in a hurry, ask, can I help you? Um, but again, giving them the opportunity to try things on their own and just recognizing when they're becoming frustrated and offering support that way. Um, the fourth um, piece to our path to independence is providing positive messages. Every single thing we do is um, in a positive way. Um, we do avoid the word no unless safety is an issue. Um, but again, telling children what they can do rather than what they can't. Um, creating what we call yes environments. So I think about our infant room specifically. They can go anywhere. We have created that environment that's shoeless. Um, so when um, they do come in and start moving and rolling and we put them in natural positions, they can um, go anywhere in the classroom. We do the same thing with our toddlers and twos as well as preschoolers. Uh, we want them to explore on their own. They're naturally curious. And so we want to create those spaces um, that encourage them to do that. And then our positive messaging, those environments say, yes, come on in, try this. Um, the fifth step is expanding their language. So being very descriptive in what you're doing. It might seem silly to you. I'm going to put the food on the spoon and then I'm going to put the spoon in your hand. Um, but that's how they learn language. I know we're going to hear a lot of the same messages about child development and it's the repetition. Um, that's how they learn their language, um, whether it's through reading books, but just the descriptions of what we're doing throughout the day. Um, as a former infant and toddler teacher, I always said I felt like I talked to myself all day long um, because they weren't talking back with me. But again, they needed to hear those words to learn the words. Um, the sixth piece of our um, path to independence is then creating more opportunities. Um, if they love to do something and they want to do it over and over and over, by all means, let them do that. And so um, those are the six steps to kind of helping create independence um, in young children. Um, another important part of that is one through six and repeat, one through six and repeat. And so um, basically, if they really love doing something, let's find ways for them to continue to do that. Um, as we look at our early education programs, I referred to our two-year-old program as young preschool. Um, and that's the biggest thing with going off to kindergarten, a lot of kindergarten teachers in recent conversations have said self-help skills and social skills. And so we really need to focus on um, getting them independent um, so they have those skills so that they'll find success um, in kindergarten as well. And we do start that as a young age. They're not needing to read when they get there. They're not needing to know all their numbers and letters and alphabet, it helps. Um, but again, being independent, um, as well as having those social skills are most important. So um, I hope this was helpful. I love talking about um, independence in young children and I look forward to meeting you all on Saturday. Thank you so much, Carrie. Be oh, sure yeah. and stop by CDW at Play Child Care Center on Saturday at the Bump to Baby. And next up, we have Tamarack Country School. Lucia Tenson is the director of Tamarack Day Camp and Country School. In addition to the preschool setting, she has worked in public schools and has taught at the undergraduate and graduate levels in college. Welcome, Lucia. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. Let's talk a little bit about early childhood education. So for tonight, I'm going to define it from birth to five years old. And we're going to talk about what if we decide to find some classes outside the home? What are the benefits of finding classes outside the home, whether it be daycare, a parent-child class, a preschool? There's so many. The key is socialization and that the fact this is the first time that your child is going to be in an environment with somebody that isn't you. So they're learning to know that it's a safe environment. They're learning that they can make friends. They're learning that they can take risks. They're learning that they can be safe and secure with another person that's not their primary caregiver. So you're like, okay, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to go and look at some classes. What do I do next? Tour. That's the word. You want to go out and tour the place where you're thinking your child might be? You want to go and tour. Are in this area, 
we register very early. Most most um, child care centers do. You want to be doing those tours the fall. I know it's hard to say, but the fall before you think your child's going to be going to school. So you'll set up an appointment. You'll talk to the director. You'll go in person. And what's the most important thing to do? Stand in the environment. Go in that classroom and just stop and look. What's on the shelves? Are they toys that are engaging? Are they active? What are the children doing in their, those classes? Are they playing? Are they playing with each other? Are they exploring their environment? And then there comes the teacher. Who is your child's role model when you're not there? So what is that teacher doing? Are they sitting on the rug and scaffolding play? Are they engaged in helping your child branch out? And do children in the class naturally gravitate toward, towards them? You can tell so much how children, as you're touring, are interacting with the teachers within their classroom. It tells you light years about a program. So you're thinking about that. You're thinking, okay, I like this environment. Now comes the time, what is the outside environment? Is there good outside space? Nature is such a great self-regulator for our children. Do they have the opportunity to be outside, to explore? Do playgrounds feel safe? Are there different levels of nature and things like that? Okay, you've done your classroom. You've done your outdoor space you're feeling good. Now it's time to ask those uh, tough questions to the director. What do you ask the director? When you're sitting there, what are some things that I know I hope parents ask in a, in a tour, and if they don't, I give them the answers anyway. One is, what's the student-teacher ratio? How many adults are in the class with my child at all times? What's that ratio look like? How do they choose their teachers? What are the credentials? What makes, what makes that teacher the right fit for that class? And then thinking a little bit more even before that, do teachers come and stay? What's that teacher retention rate? That can tell you light years about any program. If teachers are staying, you're learning that that culture is happy and healthy for the teachers that are there. Then you want to, you know, one of the big things about any early childhood classroom is for you and your child to become part of a larger community. How do they, how does that school help build community? Are the parents that you're going to meet in a parent-child class still going to be with your child in pre-K? So ask the hard question, what's the family retention rate? How many families who are eligible for re-enrollment enroll the next year? That will tell you, are parents happy with the program as well? So if you're thinking about all of those pieces, you also have to ask some of the brass tacks questions. What's the diapering, diapering policy? That is different at every school. How do they manage toilet training? Is that something that's a prerequisite? Is it something that never has to be a prerequisite? So asking those kinds of questions as well. And then as you move further for what kind of financial implication are there? Is there a refund? If you decide, you know, I really thought this was the right program, but you know, that was September. My child's very different in June. I think I wanna use a different program. What's the, ref what's the refund policy? Those are brass tacks questions, but at the end of the day, trust your gut. You know, you'll walk in. This area has some of the most outstanding early childhood programs. Walk in and trust your gut. If it feels right, then most likely it is gonna be the right fit. I look forward to hopefully meeting many of you on Saturday. Um, and thank you so much for letting me be part of this Spark Talk today. Thank you so much um, for those final presentations. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions for the uh, Black Three presenters. The first one um, is going to go towards um, Jessica at Clementine. The question is: There are so many toys out there for babies and toddlers. <laughs> what should I be looking for? Yes, and I, you know, I mentioned in the beginning when I was chatting with you before, um, Amazon and every place, every store you walk into, you know, a thousand toys that, um, you know, the adver the packaging would let you feel like this is the essential toy my child has to have it. Um, and, you know, the question really depends a lot on individual families, their values, how much space they have, how many other children they have. Um, but the overarching um, idea that I suggest to parents is a simpler toy is usually a better toy. Um, it doesn't mean the toy has to be open-ended, meaning like blocks or, um, 
Legos or pieces that kids can build in their own constructions. Those are great, but not every toy has to be like that. But um, I see a lot of toys now that are kind of multifunction, which definitely appeals to an adult's sense of efficiency. But when toys are trying to do a lot of different things at one time, um, it can end up feeling really distracting to, to the child. And so usually a simpler toy is a better toy. Um, and then I usually feel that a toy that um, can grow with children is a great thing to think about too, um, because it allows the toy to be fun and exciting for um, a range of their babyhood all the way into, for some toys all the way through um, the preschool years in different ways. So using toys, could, you know, baby uses a toy differently than a toddler will, but if you see a toy that grows with your child, that's really a great um, thing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question. This one, I believe, is for Carrie. Um, so the question is, my toddler uh, gets frustrated when they can't get something right. What are some tips for a frustrated toddler? You know, I think looking at what they're trying to do and seeing how we can simplify that, it, it all kinds of depends on what it is. Um, but again, the positive messages that we get children, that's how we learn is to just keep trying and there's no such thing as failing. I know uh, toddlers don't understand that word, um, but I think too, as a toddler teacher, if I saw that happening, I would reach for another toy that they could easily find success in. For example, if it's a shape sorter and they're just not getting that one, you can also point to places where it might go. It's okay um, to walk them through as long as you're using your own words as well saying, can I help you with that? Let's try this one. And so um, guiding their hands in the right direction if it's a shape sorter, for example. Um, but again, it's just positive messages. It's um, not showing your frustration so that they know, um, you know, just reassuring them it's okay and we're going to keep trying and we're going to get this together. I think most importantly is when they get it, you celebrate and um, you encourage them to do it over and over and over um, once they do um, accomplish that, which they will. Um, it just might take a time or two to get it. Thank you. <clears throat> That was another selfish question. I also have a two-year-old, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but once again, it is a question I'm asked often in the library world is I have a very, um, a child that exhibits a lot of big emotions. What books would you recommend? So, and we have one more question. This is for Lucia. The question is, how do we confirm the director at a daycare center um, is conveying correct information about teacher retention ratio and family retention ratio? It's a really good question. I think when something, I would say in early childhood, as in every profession, there's, there's honesty. You, you, you will be able to see it when you're in a center. You'll be able to see what the center feels like. But at the end of the day, you have to trust your director. And if you're feeling like they're not giving you accurate information, your gut's telling you it's not the place for you because your director is one of the persons that's gonna be with you from the time your child starts to your child goes through to kindergarten. They're gonna be with you on so many different situations that if you don't have, if it doesn't feel right and you feel like that information doesn't feel factual, then it's not the place for you because at that moment, your gut is gonna be what tells you the right fit for your child. Thank you so much. Um, so that ends our Q&A for that block three um, set of presenters. Uh, we still have all of our presenters here um, to offer any lingering questions, uh, answers to any lingering questions that you may have. Um, if you do have any of those, uh, you can put them in the Q&A box now. Um, I uh, am wonderfully delighted that you were all here to join us today. Um, tomorrow, not tomorrow, what is time? Uh, Saturday, um, April 15th from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. is our Bump to Baby Expo at Vernon Area Public Library. And we'll have all these presenters and more available for all of your very direct, personal, face-to-face needs that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else all in one place. 
Um, they'll be there for you to, uh, if you have questions like that come to mind right after you leave, jot them down, um, or uh, maybe you have a better memory than I do. Maybe you'll just remember them um, and bring them to the expo um, because all of these wonderful people are here for you. Um, Cause I know that early childhood can be an incredibly challenging time, very new, very different experience than anything. Um, uh, especially if it's a new experience um, than you've ever had before. But um, all these people are here for you. And I do not have any further questions available for our presenters. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Jen to go ahead and wrap up the session. Thank you for all of our presenters this evening. We appreciate you generously giving your time uh, to our community on very important topics um, and helping us create a sense of community um, with all of you and the library. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you Saturday the 15th at the library for our 2023 Bump to Baby. And um, this recording or this will be available uh, beginning next week. So thank you everyone and good night. I'll be ending the recording now.